Coming up on Max TV, we preview Showbox with Andre Ward and Mikkel Kessler, and we take a look at news and notes. Coming up on the next round. And welcome to the next round, brought to you by Everlast Worldwide. Steve Kim, Gabriel Montoya, back in the skybox. We begin round number one, a special edition of Showbox for the WBA Super Middleweight title of the world. Mikel Kessler takes on Guzmil Perdomo. And then from Temecula, California, Andre Ward takes on Shelby Pudwell. Gabriel, college football started this week, and we had some non-conference patsies like Florida, defending national champions, taking on Charleston Southern with the predictable result. I have the feeling before the Super Six, this is what we're getting. Florida versus Charleston Southern with Mikkel Kessler and Andre Ward. Yeah, this is kind of the appetizer before the main course. Uh, you know, Mikkel Kessler, since his loss to Joe Calzaghe back in 2007, has only fought twice. So, in a sense, this is a good bout for him. It's a bit of a tune-up. He kind of shakes some of that ring rust off before he just jumps right into the tournament, uh, you know, after sitting on... on on the bench for like uh, all of 2009. Whereas Andre Ward gets to stay busy, he doesn't let his opponent get a, a bit of an edge over him by fighting more often. And, and at the same time, you know, with the opponent that they've got lined up for him, he may end up with a nice highlight reel for us. Uh, I think Mikkel Kessler is the known and unknown. Uh, guys like me are making him the favorite to win this thing. That's just my personal opinion. But Mikkel Kessler, you're right, ever since he beat Joe Calzaghe, prior to that, he was a very busy, active champion. He was a regular guy on the scene with his old promoter. Uh, but since then, he's been bogged down from, from professional and some promotional strife. Yeah. We really don't know what Mikel Kessler has at this moment. It's been a long while since we've seen him, almost one full calendar year. Yeah, you, you almost have to wonder, you know, I mean, Jeff Lacey was really affected mentally by being outboxed by Joe Calzaghe over 12 rounds. And you, you have to wonder what's left with, with, with Mikel Kessler. He seemed to, to balk at a few highlight, uh, uh, big high-profile fights. Uh, he couldn't seem to quite, you know, figure out what exactly he wanted to do. He was going to move to light heavyweight. And then he finally decided to do the Super 6. It, uh, it makes me wonder, you know, uh, how he's been affected, if the kind of fights that he's taken, you know, granted the guys had winning records as opposed to uh, his opponent, who, who has only fought twice since 2007 as well, but he bounced back with a guy that was like 7, 27, and 1. Yeah. You know, Kessler's actually fought some guys with winning records, uh, but not exactly world beaters. So I'm really curious to see, you know, just what, he, what he's like uh, in this fight. I don't think it's going to be a huge gauge of, of how he's going to do against Ward, although I will say that this opponent um, does kind of fight a little bit like Ward uh, when Ward is fighting out of the southpaw style. He's, he's kind of a, a stick-and-move kind of guy. Um, he seems to have power against lower-level opponents, uh, particularly from, the, from, from range. And he's got a really nice, sneaky uh, right hook off of his jab. It's going to be, I think he's between the two fighters, between Ward and Kessler, He's got the, the tougher style to deal with that you night. You think about Mikel Kessler, we know what he has, one of the very best jabs in boxing. Mm -hmm. But he's also what I call a straight line fighter. If you take him off the railroad tracks and you move one foot, uh, when you make him reset and move his feet, there's no doubt about it. Mobility will trouble Mikel Kessler. But he has a very good jab, a good straight one, too. But in this tournament, if he wants to win it with guys like Andre Ward yeah. and Andre Durrell and even a Jermaine Taylor, there's going to be some athleticism, and guys are going to make him step around and make him move his feet and reset. It'll be very interesting to see how Mikel Kessler deals with it. Now, Andre Ward is a guy, we talked about this last week, Gabe. You visited him in camp in Oakland, California. You are picking him to win this thing. You think he's going to make that big jump up from all of a sudden Perhaps fighting the B-level guys to winning the Super 6. That is bold, my friend. Well, I'm, I haven't picked him exactly to win the whole Super 6. I'm picking, it's coming down to, to him and Arthur Abraham mm. for me. Uh, you know, as we get further in the tournament, I'll probably make my final pick. But I like his versatility. I, I think, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, Kessler being kind of limited by movement. Uh, the thing that, that that strikes me about Ward is that his fluidity and style and his mental approach to the game, and that he, he can fight southpaw, he can fight orthodox. He he's showing that he can be aggressive or he can be defensive. Uh, I, I really am excited about his versatility as a fighter. Now, granted, that's been against the B-level guys. I don't think Edison Miranda is, is exactly a litmus test for how he's going to do against Mikkel Kessler, and certainly Shelby Pudwell is, is no, is, he, is not listen, a measuring stick uh, either. Hold on, in the famous words of a presidential or vice presidential debate, uh, I know. Mikkel Kessler, and Shelby P Pudwell is no Mikkel Kessler. Let's just put it like that, Gabe. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a hard guy from, you know, North Dakota. Uh, he got blown out by John Duddy at middleweight in one round. Uh, there's really no tape of the guy. Uh, I, I don't really see that he has much of a chance. I mean, like I said, his last opponent was 7-27-1. and one. I hate to be stereotypical about this, but in the game of boxing, that, that is a part of it, that you could look at the geography or you could look up on BoxRec and see where a guy is from. And when they're from the flyover states, the red states in between <laughs> the east and west coast, when you start going into certain geographic areas, there are certain states that all of a sudden they are buzzwords for 
cannon fodder. And yeah. I think this is Shelby Pud well. Yeah, that's exactly what he is. Um, you know, he's he's kind of tall. He's kind of rangy. Uh, he's there to maybe give some rounds or maybe give, uh, in my opinion, I think he's going to give a highlight reel to Andre Ward. I mean, in, in a sense, you know, rather than having 24-7, uh, like, a, you know, a three-part or four-part infomercial, they're going to have the, this Showtime card and, and kind of, you know, display Kessler finding a guy that fights a little bit similar to Andre Ward. So we get a commercial about how he's going to look against yeah. a, a guy like Andre Ward. And Andre Ward gets to probably get a knockout and, and look a little more exciting than he has in his last few fights. I'm just going to say this. From my personal perspective as a viewer of HBO and Showtime, I'd much rather to see two highlight reel knockouts than some guy drinking his own urine. Well, that's it from round number one of the next round brought to you by Everlast. We come back. We take a look at a December to remember. <laughs> and we are back on the next round. Gabriel Montoya, Steve Kim. This is sponsored by Everlast Worldwide. And we look ahead to a few months. It is indeed a December to remember. These fights are on the books. December 5th on Showtime for the WBO Junior Welterweight title. Tim Bradley takes on Lamont Peterson. Vic Darchinian will lead up this card. And also, December 26th on HBO, the day after Christmas, for the WBA Welterweight title, Shane Mosley takes on Joshua Claudia. I, I tell you what, usually when you get to the very end of any calendar year, that's when people kind of wind it down. But if you look at the schedule, there's going to be another Latin Fury perhaps on December 12th. There might be even another show from what I'm hearing. Uh, I think 2009, in general, is off to a very good start, had a little bit of a lull, but we are finishing with the flourish in 2009. Oh, yeah, I can't wait for the back end here. I mean, just, I just kind of want to forget that summer ever existed. It was, it was a long, dry summer, man. Uh, it seems like, you know, for fight fans, with December 5th, with, with Bradley and Peterson, the Christmas came early, and with the December 26th show, it, it came a little late for, for Joshua Claudi. Uh, what a wasted year for Shane Mosley, man. He had that... Big beginning to the year, you know, he's almost like a microcosm of the boxing year. He starts out with a bang, knocking out Antonio Margarito, and he waits till December 26th to finally get a fight, and who does he get? He waited for a high-profile guy, he gets Josh Claudio. Well, Gabe, here's the thing, he was like that proverbial dog that kept chasing his own tail. Chasing it over and over, kept going round and round, was never going to get it. Looking at fights, getting fights, or actually asking for fights, he was never going to receive, you know, getting his own PR from putting out these illogical releases. But I'm glad he got this. From a promotional standpoint, from everything that I've been told, this fight will be just a few blocks down the road from where we're sitting right now at the Staples Center. Yeah. I have to be honest with you. Number one, L.A. in December 26th, there's a lot of things going on. First of all, it's the day after Christmas. I, I think it's very interesting. You're going to have a weigh-in on Christmas Day. Okay, that's going to be very interesting. I've never heard of such a thing for a major fight. Second of all, he's not a draw. Neither guy is really a draw. And the 11th no. commandment that I've heard is, thou shall have a Mexican while in L.A. doing a boxing show. I don't know if how biblical you are. Uh, third of all, he is an African-American. I have to be honest with you. I think the only guy that could fill Staples Center that is of his culture and race and creed is Kobe Bryant. So I'm actually looking forward to this, but I'm a hardcore boxing nut. I want to actually see how many people are going to show up the day after Christmas for Claude Mosley when neither guy is really a draw. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a litmus test for, you know, how big a fight fan uh, you know, all of us are. I mean, I, I'm excited by it, but it, it is totally a, a pure fight fan's fight. Uh, it, it's not marquee value. Neither of these guys are going to talk any trash yes. and, and get us very excited. And really, even looking at the styles, you know, I, I don't think Claudi can be knocked out. Granted, we said that about Margarito, but he did have a come-forward Mexican style that played in right. Mosley's hands. But, you know, Claudi's not exactly an exciting guy. And I, I almost look at it, this is going to be another version of, you know, a Claudi fight where he does just enough to lose. Yeah, Claudi, the thing about Claudi is that he's very hard to hit cleanly. You get a lot of arms, a lot of elbows, a lot of shoulders, but he's like the classic, Mex uh, excuse me, the classic African fighter from Ghana that they are built rock solid. Yeah. And he's a very, very sturdy guy, and he may have a chin that equals Margarito even beyond. So oh, from I a stylistic so. standpoint, I don't think there's any doubt. It's a tough fight. He probably does enough just to lose and bitch about getting robbed, but it will be a 12-round fight. And can we give Tim Bradley some credit? Look Dude. at this gauntlet he's on. We're talking about non-conference schedules. Well, i got to tell you, you take a look at what this guy has fought the last four fights. Uh, if he was a football conference, he would be the SEC. He is not taking on a lot of lightweights or cream puffs in the last year or so, Gabe. No, it's ridiculous. I mean, he's really staking his claim as, you know, I'm the best 140-pounder in the world, and, you know, anybody else that doesn't believe it, you know, then come and, come and prove me otherwise. It, it, it's pretty amazing, man. This is a really good fight. Classic, you know, uh, 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 Bradley comes forward. He's kind of a, a Spartan warrior style. Uh, you know, he's not exactly the cleanest boxer in the world. I'm not saying he, he fouls, but, you know, he, he kind of wings shots, and he just breaks your body down. And then you've got a pure boxer in Lamont Peterson, uh, who doesn't have a hell of a lot of power, but is going to move and 
move and throw a lot of combinations and make him work all night long. It's a great fight. You know, this is uh, to a certain degree, and I'm not saying they're as good as either guy. Stylistically, though, you got the short little guy who's very athletic, throws a lot of punches, likes to be in and out against the tall, lean guy that likes to jab from the outside and square you off and really box. Shane Mosley, Vernon Forrest. I think that is an apt comparison from a stylistic standpoint, Gabe. I, I would agree. You know, I, I, I'm just sitting here, I'm, I'm coming up with the question that, uh, you know, is it fair of us to, to criticize Mosley for kind of ending up with a guy that isn't that big of a name, but is, you know, one of the tougher guys right. in the division? Uh, you know, and then we turn back around and we, we praise Bradley for taking on Lamont Peterson. I mean, maybe it's a... Well, there's a difference, though. Uh, Tim Bradley is not at the stage of Shane Mosley where he feels almost entitled, and maybe rightfully so, yeah. that, hey, I shouldn't be fighting in small venues and I need the big names. That I can understand from Shane. The problem with Shane was, uh, I think most people, if they were logical about it and they were surrounding Shane, if they were honest, they would have told Shane, move on from Manny Pacquiao. You're not going to get Miguel Cotto. That's the true. thing I like about Tim Bradley, he's young, he's hungry. But here's the thing. That's the difference between him and Shane Mosley. Tim Bradley is active. Every three, four, five months, you will see him in the ring. There's no press releases. There's no calling out of everybody. He just gets down to business and does what he does best. That's Fight. true. Make money. Yeah, he's building himself into an attraction. I mean, Thompson Boxing is doing a hell of a job yes. with him. They're matching him really hard, and the guy is rising to the occasion. You know, somebody this week uh, in my mailbag was asking me, you know, name me a guy that, that we didn't know anything about that was green, that came out of nowhere to, to raise up his game and, and show us that he was ready for the world stage. And he was talking about Ward versus Kessler and my picking uh, Ward in that fight. And I said, I'll give you one example, Tim Bradley. Yeah, the thing I like about Tim Bradley is his people had reached out to Mir Khan, they had reached out to Ricky Hatton, they're willing mm -hmm. to take less money, they're willing to fly across the ocean, do it on their canvas. But they know at this stage it's not a big fight, and maybe Tim Bradley, risk versus war pendulum, doesn't really swing in their direction. So this is what a fighter has to do. Instead of bitching and moaning and calling guys out, you know what you have to do? Build your resume. And I've got to tell you, if he beats Lamont Peterson, I think this is a very tough fight. Great resume builder, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, he can easily say, you know, I'm, I'm the best 140-pounder in the world. And, and so Manny Pacquiao, you know, comes and faces him. Uh, I would tend to agree with him. I think there's be two categories. There's Manny Pacquiao being the biggest name, biggest marquee attraction, sure. and certainly the biggest star in all of boxing. But in terms of actual resume at 140, uh, if Tim Bradley, the Desert Storm, can beat Lamont Peterson, a classy boxer, uh, I, I don't think that there's any doubt that if you take away Manny Pacquiao and his star power, the best junior welterweight in the world in terms of resume is the Desert Storm. In years, you'd have really to say. In really wow. in years. I mean, you know, look at Holt, you know, Cherry. Uh, now he's taking on Bradley. He just got Cam or uh, you know, Junior Witter on, in yeah, Nottingham. Yeah, Junior Witter, Peterson, and then Campbell. Yeah. And that's a hell of a resume for a young fighter, for any fighter. I'm really impressed. Yes. Yeah, so that's it for round number two of the next round. We wrap it up with news and notes. And we wrap things up here on the next round, brought to you by Everlast Worldwide. We go to news and notes. We go to the fight preview Saturday night in Puerto Rico for the WBO Junior Flyweight title of the world. We have a rematch. Ivan Calderon takes on Rodel Mayol. Saturday, we have another version of Latin Fury, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. and Fernando Montiel co-headline going back up top. I was there at the fight for Calderon Mayol won June 13th, Madison Square Garden. Uh, I thought that was an absolute dead-even fight. I think Rodel Mayol is live. I think he is absolutely in this fight. My question is, you're in Puerto Rico. Can you beat Ivan Calderon on the island? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. You know, I mean, I think the only way you're going to do it is maybe get a knockdown or two, maybe get the late stoppage, which, you know, it was way too early to tell if that was even in the cards. But Mayol just seems so much bigger. He's 5'4", he's, he's four inches taller than, than mm -hmm. uh, Calderon, who's, who's really been a career 105-pounder. And he's the guy that's moving up in weight to Mayol's, you know, 108 pounds. Uh, I, I think it's a, an interesting fight. I'm probably going to go with the upset special Ooh, with it. I thought, you wow. know, as Mayol uh, let his hands go, you know, maybe the first two punches uh, didn't land on the defensive specialist Calderon, but the, the last two seemed to. And, and really the size disparity is it would come in close. Calderon kept tying up and Mayol kept shoving him off. Um, and it seemed to be, a, the strength of Mayol seemed to be a bit of a puzzle for Calderon. I mean, he's 34 years old. He's a guy who doesn't have much power. He's got, what, six knockouts in, in 33 fights. Uh, his style is predicated on speed and technique. And as, you know, when he hits 34, he's, he's getting older, that speed is kind of dropping off. And, you know, I think there's two types of speed here. You know, the, the speed you start out with from training camp and you're fresh in the first four or five rounds, and then there's the speed that you tire into. And I think that the speed that he's tiring into is, is getting slower and slower for Calderon. That is bold, my friend, picking against this Boricua in 
Puerto Rico. I think that's bold. I agree with you. I, I think one of the key elements of fighting an older fighter and fighting any southpaw is number one, crowding him and then activity. Yeah. That if you get him into exchanges, if you get him on the in close, well, at that point, the punches may seem a little bit different, but exchanging at that point takes away really a lot of the mystery of where the punches come from. Yeah. Uh, and talking to Rodel Mayo last week, he has the right plan. He understands the geography. Uh, the thing about Ivan Coldren, you talked about this in terms of the, of the wear and tear and the tread. He's like that classic old car. Still looks great. It's a classic old car. It's in mint condition. But you know what? You're not going to take it on a cross-country journey. You might no. take it around the block every Sunday, every other week. You might go to the market with it. But you're not going to go to Las Vegas with it and come back two days later. No. Uh, I get the sense that Calderon's going to get off to a fast start. He's going to win the early rounds. But I just have a question. Can Rodol Mayol do enough every round, convincingly enough, to win this fight. Here's what I think. You're going with the upset special. I'm going with the upset somewhat controversy. Uh, I think wow. that he's going to do enough to win the fight, maybe seven rounds to five, but when it's all said and done, the scorecards are red, and still, it's, it will be Ivan Calderon, in my view. I can see that. Uh, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Hmm. Is it just me, or have you stopped really giving a damn? Uh, it's not just you. Because he has <laughs> too, hasn't he? Yeah, it, it seems like it, man. I mean, you know, he's fighting Jason LeHoulier uh, this time out. I mean, he's hit... The, you know, he's hitting the 40 fight peak, you know, the, the 40 fight mark. At, at this point, we should kind of know what we have. And, you know, I, I don't think he's going to build into anything, you know, greater than what he is. I, I guess at this point, we do know what we have. We've got a, you know, a, a name. This is the son of a, a, of a name. Uh, is a guy that will sell tickets on Latin Fury and people will buy him when there's no other fight out there but I don't think he's ever going to be a, a top 154 well, pounder. He's from boxing royalty. He's like the son of a Kennedy and he'll always have a sense of entitlement. He'll have opportunities. The thing that's very disconcerting, even if he's not improving, if he was working hard in camp, dedicating himself, and really getting the most out of his ability, I could respect that. But right now, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., his work ethic is absolutely deplorable from what I've been told and he is the four-letter effort in boxing that I hate lazy. And when you're lazy like that, why should fans get behind you? I was told that he brought in the velocity people, the strength and fitness condition people that do a lot of work with a lot of athletes and celebrities. They basically got thrown out of Big Bear, out of that camp. Guess why? They worked him too hard. Hello, you're in the game of professional boxing last time I checked. The yeah. one thing about Chavez, he does make for good fights, but he's very lucky he has a beard. But I've gotten the sense, Gabe, in the last 18 months, he has plateaued and stagnated because the work ethic simply does not exist. Yeah, if you're not willing to do the work before, I mean, you know, then what are you, you going to do in the fight? You know, any adjustments that, the, that you try to make, is, that then is not the time to learn. The, the time to learn is, is before you get there. And as we're seeing, I mean, he, he had an injury in camp, which may or may not have been injury? real. Yeah, I think he yeah. strained his back Quote, trying to unquote, do some sit-ups. No, doing a sit-up. <laughs> and all I'm going to say is we talked about this with Andre Ward, uh, with Jason LeHoulier, all due respect to him. They're, they're running out of guys over the flyover states to pick on. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, they're going to have to start fighting someone decent. Now, what I've been told is that in December, they'll have another Latin Fury uh, with John Duddy. John Duddy will fight October 10th. He'll fight December 12th in Mexico. And the big step-up fight, if you want to call that, Madison Square Garden 2010, will be Chavez Jr. against John Duddy. Take that for what it's worth. Yeah, get that look off your face, Gabe. I, I just said take it for what, what it's worth. Well, we take a look <laughs> at some bucks. tidbits here on the next round. <laughs> Brought to you by Everlast Worldwide as we wrap it up October 31st on Showtime for the IVF Bantamweight title. Joseph Agbeko will take on mandatory contender Yanni Perez. Nice. Then October 24th in Puerto Rico, Carlos Quintana and Kermit Cintron to co-headline a dark show. I'm going to go with the upset special right now. I like Yanni Perez. Wow. Big, strong guy. He's a real welterweight. Agbeko is there to get hit. I think this is a fantastic little matchup. And kudos for Showtime to sticking with Agbeko, even though he beat their house guy. You know what I like about Ken Hirschman and Showtime? They actually make fights. They're not concerned about fighters. They actually like a fight. Yeah, this is, you know, if you've been following Ani Perez at all or even Joseph Agbeko, man, this is yet another fight fan's dream. I mean, uh, I I'm really curious to see you know, if there's going to be a, a letdown from fighting a big name like Darchinian. You know, if Agbeko can keep that momentum going, unlike Nonino Donaire mm -hmm. did when he beat Darchinian, and, and see if this guy is really the real deal. I'm going to stick with, with Agbeko here. I, I really, I kind of believe in this guy. I, I saw him win his title. Uh, you know, I, I thought he had a chance to beat Darchinian. I didn't think he was going to do it that way, and I, I, I you know, I did pick Darchinian late. Uh, but 
This guy is just proving himself every time out. He's a little bit different than your typical, uh, you know, Ghanaian fighter. He's a guy that moves around a bit. Yeah, he kind of reminds me of the old the professor. A little more head movement. Yeah, a lot more head movement. You know, and he's just kind of tricky. Uh, you know, he may not do a lot of different things, but what he does well, you know, he does very, very well. Uh, key difference, though, uh, Victor Archinian uh, showed me on that night. Maybe it was a bad night. He was really a 115 pounder trying to masquerade as a bantamweight. This really is a 118 pounder in Yanni Perez. Yeah. And Carlos Quintana and Kermit Citron, I got to tell you, this is the state of the business. That if there's not an HBO or Showtime date for you, you either fight off TV for small money or you don't fight at all. So in that respect, I give them credit. I mean, if you're Kermit Cintron, you can't be happy. Here you beat Alfred Petto Angulo, yet it is Angulo with the November 7th HBO date. But at the very least, hey, you get to go to Puerto Rico. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear it's nice that time of year. But, you know. Well, there's it, a lot of things that are nice in Puerto Rico. You know, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't really understand it. You know, I don't, I don't know who to criticize here. But I, I'd be a little pissed off if I were him. You know, he, he deserves the TV date. He had a hell of a performance. He upset, you know, one of HBO's big stars. But that's the politics, politics of the game. They can roll Angulo back to ESPN, give him a rebuilding fight, and then bring him right back to network. Where, as, you know, Kermit Cintron, he's kind of hard to match up. He looked great against Angulo, but, you know, then he was the, the mandatory for Martinez, and nobody wanted to see that. You know fight. what? I give them credit, though. They could have bitched, mo whined, and moaned, but instead they're going out there applying their trade. And I know there has to be a sense of frustration, but you know what? Fighters should fight, and that's what they're doing. Yeah, stay busy. Yeah, so stay in sharp. that respect, my hat's off to them. Well, that's it for this week's edition of TNR on behalf of Gabriel Montoya and the rest of Max Boxing. Till the next round, goodbye, everybody.